Starting off our list with a fiend that slinks in the shadows, at number 10, we have the Shadow Demon from the Monster Manual. This demon is not naturally occurring, but instead is formed from the remnants of a demon that could not fully reform in the abyss. It likes to hide in the shadows and attack from there, hence the name. Even more than that, they are incorporeal, letting them face their creatures and objects at half speed, and they fly just as fast as they walk. In dim light or less, they can also hide as a bonus action, and they have expertise in stealth, making it very likely they will avoid your perception checks. Anytime they attack you with advantage, such as from hiding, they deal an extra 2d6 points of damage added to their attacks as well. Did I mention they deal psychic damage, so it's unlikely you'll have any innate resistance to it? This creature is also immune to cold, lightning, and poison damage, which means spells like Shock and Grass will not affect them at all. On top of that, they resist acid, fire, necrotic thunder, and all physical damage that isn't magic, so your spellcasters will have a hard time damaging them at all as will your fighter, rogue, or barbarian unless you've lucked into a magic weapon at low levels. Shadow demons also have proficiency in both dexterity and charisma saves, making it less likely they'll take damage from spellcasters. They also are completely immune to exhaustion, being grappled, paralyzed, petrified, poisoned, prone, or restrained, so you cannot use any tricks to hold them in place aside from lowering their speed to zero. But all hope is not lost as shadow demons have one key weakness. They are vulnerable to radiant damage and to have light sensitivity, so in an area of bright light they have disadvantage on attack rolls and perception checks, making it impossible for them to get advantage and therefore the extra 2d6 damage on attack rolls. So long as you stay within the light while being ambushed by one of these creatures, you should be much more likely to succeed in combat against them. Because their entire kit is very one note, being a stealth ambusher who only has one means of attack and makes one attack per round, they are the least threatening of this list, but that doesn't mean you should take them lightly. Haunting this world rather than moving on, at number 9, we have the Ghost from the Monster Manual. Ghosts are, as you might imagine, a bit difficult to combat. They move through anything at half speed since they're incorporeal. They can't be interacted with unless they're on the material plane. If they're on the ethereal plane, you can see them, but you can't touch or be touched by them unless they move to the material. If you are actually engaging the ghost on the material, then you have to make a wisdom saving throw just from looking at them to avoid being frightened. If you fail particularly badly, you are also aged anywhere from 10 to 40 years. They can deal you 46 plus 3 necrotic damage with a touch, and if you're close enough to touch, they can actually possess you and take control of your body until you reach zero hit points, or the ghost is turned, or forced out by dispel evil and good or similar magic. For as long as they have control of you, they can use your statistics, but don't have access to anything you know, like your class features or proficiencies. Luckily, ghosts don't have any hit points or a very high AC, so you'd think they might be easily beaten. Unfortunately, they are resistant to acid, fire, lightning, thunder, and non-magical physical damage, making most good spells weak against them at best and giving your martial characters a rough time trying to really dish out the damage. On top of that, they're also fully immune to cold, necrotic, and poison damage, and most conditions that could disable them, like charms, paralysis, or restraints. The bright side of fighting a ghost is that you can actually avoid fighting them at all and try to solve their unfinished business instead. If you do, they pass on without the need for combat at all. So remember that combat is not always the best solution to an especially difficult foe. Proving that warlocks have it rough even in the afterlife, at number 8 we have the Deathlock from Morden Caden Presents Monsters of the Multiverse. As the name implies, these are undead warlocks who are raised by their patron for failing to abide by the terms of their contract, forced into service into the afterlife and beyond. Originally printed in Morden Caden Tomes of Foes, they have low hit points for a CR4 monster at only 36, but they are deadly attackers from a distance as far as 120 feet with their Grave Bolt, that acts like a stronger Eldritch Blast that does 2d10 plus 3 necrotic damage. And they make two of these attacks in a turn. This means if you're not prepared to fight a Deathlock, they will have the advantage of range on you. And if you make it close to them, they have claws that do almost as much necrotic damage as their Grave Bolt. As you might expect, as an undead creature, Deathlocks are immune to poison, the poison condition, and being exhausted. They're also resistant to necrotic, so don't think about using Chilling Touch or Toll the Dead on them, because those will be doing half damage. They're also resistant to physical damage so long as it isn't either magic or silvered. So if you have either a silvered weapon or a magical one, you'll be dealing full damage. If you do get closer to this creature, it also has access to four spells once per day each. Spider Climb to be out of reach on a ceiling or a wall, Dispel Magic to dispel your attempts to make it up on the ceiling or wall, Invisibility to reposition once you've found it on a ceiling or a wall, and a Hunger of Hadar to disorient and heavily damage you while you try to fight it. If your cleric manages to reach the Deathlock and tries to turn it, 
it has advantage in the saving throw through its turn resistance, making it much less likely to flee. Worse yet, these undead warlocks are almost never found alone, instead coming with a horde of undead minions at their beck and call. So you may have to fight your way through zombies or skeletons before you even get a chance to attack the deathlock. Now, this doesn't mean that fighting a deathlock is a death sentence. If possible, focus on hitting this creature with strength or constitution saving throws. It has no bonus to either, so it will often fail those. A good spell for this is Earthen Grass, which will damage them and restrain them, keeping them from doing anything particularly useful by reducing their speed to zero, giving you and your allies advantage on attacks against them, and giving them disadvantage on both attacks and dexterity saves. Sleuthing their way into your nightmares at number 7, we have the yon Nightmare Speaker from Morden King Presents Monsters of the Multiverse, though they were originally printed in Volo's Guide to Monsters. These yon are specifically Malisons, the type of yon who are half-snake rather than just reptilian humanoids. As if a snake person wasn't nightmare fuel enough, these creatures make a warlock pack with an entity that they feed nightmares harvested from their victims in exchange for power. So they do their best to terrify you before killing you. They can create an illusionary manifestation of your inner fears that literally kills you slowly, leaving you frightened of it all the while. Luckily, this ability is only usable once in combat. They can keep you at bay with two of their spectral fangs attack from up to 120 feet away, dealing more than the deathlock at 3d8 plus 3 necrotic damage to you. And if you get in close, they can constrict you, dealing damage, grappling you, and restraining you all in one fell swoop, followed up with an attack from their scimitar. And if you thought that was bad, remember that these snakes are warlocks as well. They can cast fear and darkness each twice per day, and they can see through magical darkness just as easily as normal vision, leaving them unaffected within a 15-foot radius sphere that the darkness spell creates. Thrice per day, they can cast Suggestion, meaning that before they even get into conflict, you can suggest one of your party members splits off from the group, making it easier to pick you apart. As Yonti, they also have resistance to all magical effects, giving them advantage on saving throws against magic of all kinds, whether spells or magical effects from magic items and the like. The only real resistance they have against physical attacks is their 71 hit points and 14 armor class, so your rogue, fighter, and barbarian can focus on this creature while your spellcasters act as support. But remember, they have the ability to transform into a medium-sized snake and back. So, rather than be ambushed by a snake you didn't think to suspect, be cautious around all big snakes. Just in case one of them turns out to be a Yanti nightmare speaker in disguise and jumps you. Much less powerful than the living version, at number 6, we have the Spirit Bone Naga from the Monster Manual. This bone snake is the remains of a spirit naga that was raised by yon to serve them in battle against its former kindred. Looking at the Spirit Bone Naga, you might be forgiven for thinking the shorter nature of its stat block means that it's weaker of a threat. Its only immunities are to poison damage, to being poisoned, charmed, exhausted, and paralyzed. This means they can be restrained or knocked prone without difficulty. They also have relatively low hit points at 58, though they have a 15 AC higher than most others of the CR, making them particularly resistant to targeted attacks. If you get too close to this creature, it can bite you from up to 10 feet away, dealing a total of 5d6 plus 3 damage split amongst piercing and poison, which is a lot to handle when your hit points might be 30 or less. It actually averages out to about two-thirds of your total HP. But the bite is not the worst part of this creature, as, unlike a dog, its bark can carry magical power. It has spellcasting as a fifth-level spellcaster and access to spells like a lightning bolt, which can decimate your party if you're unfortunate enough to be caught in a line. Hold person, which might keep one of your party members held fast long enough for the bone naga to bite them to death, and even sleep if they get your hit points low enough to be affected by it. Make sure you treat these snake skeletons with caution if you ever encounter one. Given a boisterous war call at number 5, we have the Orc Blade of Ilnaval from Volo's Guide to Monsters. This orc is chosen by the god Ilnaval to be a leader among orcs, but not a leader of peace. Ilnaval is the god of strategy and war, captain of the main orc god, Grumish. A blade of Ilnaval serves as a frontline war leader, with the ability to wade in and deal death with extra force. They carry javelins for fighting at range, but they prefer to attack with their longswords. When they do, they deal an extra die of damage with it, so every swing is 2d8 plus 3 damage. They also get two attacks with either option. Every round, they can move an extra 30 feet towards a hostile creature as a bonus action, and the only one they have access to, giving them the ability to chase you down at a speed of 60 feet per round, while still leaving their action open to attack. But this creature doesn't make the list for its ability to deal damage on its own or chase you down, but instead because of its ability called Innoval's Command. This ability, which recharges about every other round, allows up to three allied orcs within 120 feet of the blade of Innoval to use the reaction to make an attack. 
and the use of it doesn't take up any of the Blade of Innoval's action economy, being freely available after they make their own attacks. This means that when this orc is leading a warband, which should be always, it is able to make them way more effective than normal, giving them an extra attack. The Blade of Innoval also wears a chainmail and uses a shield, so its armor class is 18 making it very difficult to hit with attacks. However, it has no bonus to dexterity saving throws, so spells like Burning Hands can dish out good damage to it. If you encounter an Orc Blade of Innoval and its Warband, try to focus the blade down first before going after its allies. Otherwise, it will be making them more effective for as long as it remains up. Cackling its way, careering down corridors and halls at number 4, we have the Flame Skull from the Monster Manual. This creature has the most on-the-nose name of all time as it is very literally a floating skull that is on fire. Because of this, you can expect that it's immune to fire and poison damage, being a flaming undead skull. But you might be surprised to learn it also has immunity to cold damage. It cannot be frightened or charmed, poisoned or paralyzed, nor can it be knocked prone. Lightning, necrotic, and piercing damage are all resisted equally, so if you're going to deal damage to this creature, try to make sure it's thunder, acid, psychic, radiant, or force damage. If you cast a spell that requires a save though, flame skulls have magic resistance, so they'll get advantage against it. This creature is relatively fast with a 40 foot fly speed, but it only has 13 AC and an HP of 40, so once you do pin it down and are able to deal the right type of damage to it, it goes down pretty fast. But until you do, this spooky head can cast a number of mostly fire themed spells at you, like fireball for mass area damage, flaming sphere to block a corridor and let it harry you from afar, blur to make it much harder for you to hit it, or shield to avoid hits that would otherwise connect. And if they do harry you from afar, they'll do so with their two firing rays, which shoot about 30 feet and deal 3d6 fire damage. If you can prepare for an encounter with the Flame Skull, try to get fire resistance if at all possible, or you may be taking more damage than you can handle. Now, these creatures, while smart, are bound to an area and given a specific set of instructions, like guard this room, protect this object, or something similar. It follows the commands to the letter, not the intent. So, if you can figure out its command, you can avoid disrupting it and potentially have no combat with it at all. But, if it does come to combat, make sure you douse the remains with holy water or use spells like Dispel Magic or Remove Curse to unbind its spirit, or it will reform in an hour with all of its hit points and begin performing its command once again. If it reforms and its instructions are no longer possible, like if the creature object it was meant to guard no longer exists, it will become autonomous and, if you're lucky, may retain enough of its original self to be reasoned with. If not, it may just wander aimlessly, causing death and devastation until it's dealt with. Better to just unbind the spirit than to leave it to chance. Proving that when Wizards of the Coast needs a bad guy spellcaster, they tend to think of warlocks first, our number three is the Neogi Master from Morden Kidding Presents Monsters of the Multiverse. Also found in Volo's Guide to Monsters, these weird spider-like creatures is a stellar conqueror arriving on various worlds to dominate and devour, or rather it is a descendant of one, as a Niyogi no longer are capable of the stellar travel they once were. But they still recall the eldritch entities that exist between the stars, and the Niyogi Master made a pact with one of these stellar nightmares, a being like Akramar or Hadar. A Niyogi Master has the natural ability to spider climb, hanging onto ceilings or walls with ease, and can see through magical darkness, because of this, it can attack you from the ceiling in absolute magical darkness without you being able to do so much as see it, let alone have a chance of reaching it. To keep you away from it, a Neogi Master has a number of tools at its disposal. Once per day, it can use Hold Person to keep you paralyzed, Hunger of Dar to create a field of magical darkness that slowly slaps your strength until you die, and Dimension Door to create a large gap between you and it. This creature can also summon two phantasmal tentacles to attack out to 120 feet that deal 3d6 plus 4 necrotic damage apiece and prevent anyone from using their reaction. If you do happen to close the gap with one of these monsters, it has a powerful bite that deals 5d6 plus 3 damage, some poison and some piercing, and can poison you, plus a weaker claw that deals 2d4 plus 3 damage. But resorting to its fangs and claws is the last thing a Niyogi wants to do. The Niyogi Master would much rather use its once per encounter enslave ability to magically charm you and turn you into a servant for a day, forcing you to obey its every command or until one of the three Ds release you damage, distance, or death. If you take damage, you get a new save. If you move more than a mile away from the Niyogi or the Niyogi dies, the charm is broken automatically. Niyogi consider everything either food or property waiting to be claimed, so they would prefer to claim a slave and then carry you off with them rather than fight to the death. 
For this reason, be careful to never split up around a Niyogi. Smart and deadly, seated firmly at number 2 is our penultimate monster, the Hobgoblin Devastator from Morden Kaden Presents Monsters of the Multiverse. These creatures are students of war magic, proficient only with spells that enhance their ability to dish out death or control the shape of the battlefield. Never alone, these creatures ascent a fey or goblinoid military force with their presence. Because of this, whenever they cast a spell that either needs a saving throw or deals damage, they can choose any number of allies including themselves and make them immune to the spell completely. So deadly are they that their fireballs and lightning bolts will never cause harm to their allies, only to you. Their gust of wind can keep you held back while a line of archers peppers you and their melee line holds firm without being affected by the wind. And if you cross within the 60 foot threshold, they can use two devastating bolts to deal 46 plus 4 force damage each and knock you prone if it connects with you. If you close in melee with them, they have a force infused quarter staff that deals normal staff damage and an extra 3d6 force they can hit you with. But even if you do, they can surround themselves with a fireball that leaves them and their allies unaffected and burns you to a crisp. Because they don't have any risk when using their damaging spells of harming allies, and because they are very good at keeping you at a distance they want you to in order to beat you down with their devastating bolts, these hobgoblins very comfortably occupy the number 2 slot. Finally, serving your very destiny at the fates of ancient Greece at number 1, we have the Fate Hag from the Book of Many Things. These hags live in or near crossroads to the Feywild and the Shadowfell, having a disposition very much based on their environments. If you find one in shadow, it is certain to prophesy your doom. It can attack twice with its shears if you get close, dealing a modest 1d8 plus 4 force damage. If you are hit by its attack, it gives you disadvantage on attack rolls until the end of its next turn and it can replace each attack with a spell from its suit. Once per day, it can cast Bane to lower yours and your allies' d20 rolls, or bestow Curse to disable you in whatever way it sees fit, from disadvantage on attacks against it to giving it extra damage against you, or even giving you a chance to lose your turn every round. It also has the ability to cast Bless and Silent Image at will, as many times as it wants. This means the Hag keeps all of its allies under the effects of the Bless spell, giving them a bonus 1d4 to their d20 rolls, or can create an illusion of a combatant that doesn't exist, or worse, of what it perceives to be your fate. Now, all of this sounds relatively minor thus far, as despite being able to cast two spells in a round, it's not like this creature can cast two fireballs and completely devastate your party in an instant. However, this creature also has legendary resistances twice per day, automatically succeeding any two saving throws of its choice. It cannot be snuck up on with invisibility, as it has true sight out to 60 feet that allows it to see the true forms of all things that approach it, even through magical disguises and shape changes. Fate Hags also have three legendary actions per round, being the only creature outside of adventures currently in print at CR4 to have legendary actions. It can use one of these actions to teleport 30 feet, one to reduce a foe's speed to zero until the end of the foe's next turn unless that foe succeeds a strength save, or two actions to force a wisdom save with disadvantage if the target damaged the hag within the last 10 rounds. On a failed save, the creature targeted is cursed with failure, getting disadvantage on all ability checks, attack rolls, and saving throws for a minute or until they succeed three rolls. But every time they fail, they take 2d6 force damage. It can only have one creature curse at a time, but this is more than enough. With this assortment of features, the hag can keep you from succeeding against it with most of your rolls and can whittle you down slowly. On top of that, the hag often will have small fey minions at its beck and call. So, while it decides you are doomed to die, its diminutive minions will destroy your destiny. Because it is the only creature of the CR to be given legendary actions, it is a clear and obvious choice for number one. And that has been the top 10 strongest CR4 monsters, including monsters from the core and supplemental rulebooks. Are there any other monsters in core or supplemental rulebooks you think are harder to deal with? Any homebrew monsters you face at level 4 that give you a fight for your life? If so, let us know down in the comments below.